welcome to Tallinn Feminist Forum uh, to the people who have not heard me say this now for the past three days and uh, a double hello to the people who have been with us this uh, past uh, days. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, to have um, Thomas Gunnarsson today here uh, for this uh, for this lecture and later a workshop where you are also all uh, um, very welcome to join. Uh, it is, um, you can access this workshop through the same link in uh, 345. Um, as I already said, we'll be recording and uh, this is uh, uh, live streaming on Facebook as well uh, at the moment. Um, we, uh, Thomas will give a lecture and um, you, if you have questions or thoughts, you can uh, uh, add them directly to the, to the chat. And we'll have a moment where we can also like discuss a bit more and um, Thomas will Thomas will let us know how to do this exactly uh, but um, for the ones who don't know uh, who I am or why I am saying this here is that because I am uh, Nela from Feministerium who is organizing the Stalin Feminist Forum and I keep doing this in the end where I should say it at least in the beginning. <laughs> um, so, um, but with this I would really, I'm really happy to pass on the, the screen now to Thomas to you. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, so my name is Thomas Gunnarsson and I call myself the gender photographer. And I'm a photographer with a double bachelor's degree in gender studies and journalism. And I work with a lot of uh, uh, governmental institutions, companies, uh, analyzing their images from a gender perspective. And I also work as a photographer uh, to create uh, guidebooks, photo exhibitions that highlights gender stereotypes in different ways how, and how you can see, discover gender stereotypes in your everyday media flow and how you can in creative ways create different images and highlight all groups in society, not just the norm, the people you see every day in media. Um, can you see my slideshow? Okay, excellent. So I mentioned I've uh, written guidebooks about this topic also, and I have a project that was actually being launched internationally right before the pandemic. Um, Images that Changed the World, a guide to equal communication. It's a guidebook to uh, how to challenge gender stereotypes with photography and also how to create inclusive communication. And I did this project together with a small city in the middle of Sweden. And, and then the, the Swedish Institute, a government institution, decided to launch this project via embassies in Latvia, for example, Mexico, China, Russia. Then the pandemic hit and we had to do all this online instead. Uh, and I must apologize for my voice. <laughs> I've actually had a cold now, not COVID. I did a rapid test. Uh, not that it matters, I, I couldn't infect you anyway, but um, so it put brakes on this project, kind of, but we're trying to spread this. Uh, and it's actually, you can download the whole exhibition and this guidebook if you want to read more. Uh, and touring in Russia, for example, talking about uh, highlighting queer people in communication, for example, was uh, scary because they have had, in the LGBTQ festival, I gave a lecture, they've had bomb threats almost every year, having to change venue uh, the same day as they were supposed to, to ha have this festival. Um, and uh, I mean, if you know anything about the situation with uh, there's, there's a, uh, the anti-LGBTQ propaganda law, or as it, they call it in Russia, the gay propaganda law. Have you heard about this? It's actually forbidden to show LGBTQ people, same-sex couples, in a way that is seen as positive or normalizing. I don't know the exact phrasing, but I think that's the categories that are, um, and that could mean just showing a same-sex couple, family with um, same-sex uh, parents, and then you could get fined out of existence, or it's not really clear as it often is in, in Russian law, what the punishment could be. But when I was there and gave this lecture, the founder of this festival showed me this. It's posters on a bar. It's the bar next to the biggest uh, gay bar in St. Petersburg. And uh, the guy on the top here, 
um, the angry guy with a suit. He says, enough, we've, uh, we've had enough. Maybe some of you can read Russian. The gay bar is over there. And on the black poster, it says, this is the bar for normal men. And on the sunglass of this uh, gaping woman, it says, enter me. So it's like a combination of homophobia, sexism, and really, really aggressive, I think. It's, I mean, the bar next to this uh, classical old uh, gay bar, and they were very hurt because they thought that, that this bar were okay with, with having them as neighbors. So, I mean, it's, it's an interesting example, I think, of how, how discriminatory um, feelings or opinions can be reinforced by imagery. And this, this Swedish project, uh, as I said, it was a small city in the middle of Sweden that wanted to create this project with me. And that was part of a wave I, in turn, was part of creating. Um, of people criticizing gender stereotypes in the media. I have a blog called genderphotographer.com and people often send me examples, like this example, for example. Uh, it's an insurance company that made these posters to attract new customers. And everyone who's a customer in this insurance company is also small part owner in the bank that they have. And then they wanted to show, they, they wanted to have kind of an equal message that anyone can become a bank owner. So they have a female bank owner who says, who could have guessed that I would own my own bank? She looks uh, a little bit surprised or uh, smiling, a bit shyly. Uh, she plays with her hair or her earring. Can't really tell if it's the hair or the earring. She has a ribbon on her head, uh, cutely enough. And then we have a man a male bank owner who says, of course I own my own bank, don't you? Arms crossed, looking very decisive. And when I saw this, I thought, uh, is this some kind of parody? Is this supposed to be a joke? Because this really looks like 1950s levels of gender stereotypes, I think. So I wrote about this in my blog and that in turn led to even more people calling, writing to this company, wanting to know what, what are you thinking? What are you actually trying to say? The women are incompetent bank owners or leaders or experts. Uh, and this, this is another example of an image that um, actually the creators of this magazine themselves showed me this picture and said, oh, okay, you're calling yourself the gender photographer. Then we're guessing you won't like this picture. And I thought that it might uh, you to make an analysis now, to look at this image and see, what, what can you see? What differences in how the, the girls and the boys um, are portrayed, can you see in this picture? Feel free to unmute yourself and point out any difference or, or detail that attracts your attention. Well, she's smiling and looking at the camera when the uh, boys are busy in the back. Exactly, yeah. She's smiling, the only one who's smiling. She's the only one looking into the camera. Very typical that women have to look into the camera, smile, look pleasant, invite the viewer into the picture, while the boys are active. She is passive, they are active. Changing gear for a hockey game or hockey practice or something too busy to look into the camera. Uh, so who is she? That's the next question you could ask yourself, I think, when analyzing this picture. What's her role? What's, what is her relation to the other people in the picture? Any guesses? Well, she definitely looks like she has been invited that she doesn't belong because she's the only one who is doing something different and the only woman there who doesn't seem to be participating in the activity itself. Yes, I absolutely agree. She looks like a visitor or supporter or a fan. That, that are common guesses. Another common guess is that she's the girlfriend of any of the hockey players. The most common guess, actually. And all of them are wrong. She's actually also a hockey player. That's the function of this picture. The article is about her. Um, very skilled hockey player playing with this team. 
But what they realized, the, the editors of this magazine was, how are you supposed to know when you just look at this picture that she is also a, a hockey player? I mean, they could have taken a picture of her on the ice, actually playing hockey, or with the team, with ac actual hockey gear on. Uh, she's sitting here with private clothes. I mean, uh, knitted mittens. <laughs> How can you play hockey with uh, these kind of mittens? And with her hair let out, a smile. So it's, it's, it's confusing. And I would say that's the most common pattern you can see in Swedish media, international media. I have analyzed Estonian media. I'm going to treat you through some examples I, I found <clears throat> later. But that professionals that happen to be women are taken out of their professional environment, out of their uniform or professional suit, uniform, whatever. So it's difficult to guess what this person's profession is. Uh, can you guess what kind of professional this is? What is her occupation? Uh, she's a chef, I think. Okay, what makes you believe she's a chef? Because it looks like a, a kitchen in the back. Yeah, okay, you're very observant. Uh, that's right. She's standing in a kitchen. You can see some uh, salad forks or, and a fridge. Uh, but other than that, if you look at how she's posing, how she's dressed, uh, what would you guess that her occupation is? Yeah, probably something related to fashion or a model and like normal, no, what we would consider the normal standard uh, uh, woman that uh, only cares about uh, clothes and uh, how pretty she looks or this sort of uh, stigma. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it could be some kind of celebrity uh, being glamorously styled for a photo shoot about her. Then it would be a bit confusing with a kitchen in the background like this. Uh, also could be a model that I think that's a very reasonable guess. This is actually a very common post that I've seen in the fashion magazines. I call it stomach ache. I don't know if it's the best post to make as a chef. Come and try my food. Uh. <laughs> but okay, if we look at more pictures of Louise Janssen, who is a very successful chef who has competed in the highest chefs competitions in, in Sweden. Uh, in the first picture in the, in the actual article, you can see her juggling with pants with a chef's jacket on. So here you could argue, oh, isn't, isn't this a reasonable way to show that someone's a professional chef, a master chef, as the, the headline says? Um, juggling with pants, I mean, who, who can learn how to do that? Must be someone who lives in a kitchen, practically. But then, if you turn over a couple of pages in this magazine, you see a picture of a male chef showing that he's an expert in a much easier way, a bit more relaxed. He, he only had to have these crossed arms to show that he's an authority. But if you look at more pictures of Louise, you see her stealing stuff in this kitchen, stealing a mix mixer staff, looking over her shoulder as if the real chef would come and throw her out of the kitchen anytime. You see her pulling a dishwasher hose, uh, playing with her dress or showing her dress, you can also see that she's barefoot here. And I mean, uh, uh, most restaurant kitchens have very strict hygiene policies. I wonder what would happen if a chef walked in barefoot to the work uh, or washed their feet in the restaurant kitchen. And I mean, here I get a headache trying to visualize a male chef photographed like this in an article about his career, his profession, his merits as a chef. But this last image really, I think, takes the price. Can you imagine a picture of a male chef blowing water into his mouth from a dishwasher hose, looking flirtatiously into the camera? And now suddenly it's like with the imagery, they're flirting with pornographic imagery in this kind of uh, portrait about her as a professional woman, as uh, trying to illustrate her career. So this kind of clash uh, I, I wrote about in a blog post, uh, showing image by image, just putting words on what happens in these images, because I think we're not used to doing that. Just describing, okay, what, what is the person doing here? And what, oftentimes it's uh, absurd. Yeah? What year is this? This is uh, 2011. 
Okay, that's horrible. So this was, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you would wish it was even uh, like the 70s or something. But this was uh, when I started my blog. So my this was my first image analysis, actually. And I noticed how effective it was doing just this, image by image, describing what's happening in the image. Uh, is there anyone who has a question about this, this photo shoot or this picture? Any questions that spring to mind? Just why is like my main question when I'm uh, watching these pictures. Yeah, my first reaction was also just why, but I think we all know why. <laughs> like what was uh, the, what's the story behind uh, putting the, the woman in, in these sort of positions and uh, selling it sexually rather than for her profession? Yeah, it's a very reasonable question. Um, and I asked the photographer, called him and asked, uh, okay, have you, have you thought about how men and women are portrayed differently in the media? And I tried to have a construction, constructive discussion and asked him if I could use this image on my blog as an example of this. And he, he said, oh, sure. And then I said, okay, uh, I just wanna be clear that it's a, it's, I mean, it's a critical blog post I'm writing. And then he said, no, oh, okay, then I don't want to participate. And then I decided to actually publish and criticize this image um, otherwise. And he, he actually tried to sue me because of this. And that brought a lot of attention to this as well. Uh, the importance, I would say, in criticizing images like this. Um, and uh, he, after all this, it actually didn't actually go to court. I have been to court because people have sued me uh, for criticizing their images, or rather publishing them and criticizing them, which is necessary, I would say, to show the images you're criticizing. Uh, but when I actually talked to him, he, he said that when you first called me and asked, I had never heard about the word gender. So it was completely new for him having this, this perspective. But he also said that uh, I didn't want to sexualize her, and not at all. Um, I thought of her as a, um, or the instruction I gave her was to be the naughty kid who did everything you're not supposed to do in the kitchen. Uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of buy that, that you, you can see that, oh, okay, so she's doing everything you're not supposed to do, but why would you portray her as a kid, not as a professional? Um, so we had a very constructive discussion. Um, I was actually, the most common question that people ask when I show this picture in Sweden, is how could she agree to take these pictures? Uh, and I think that's, no, you didn't ask that question, but I think that's very, it's very interesting that people don't even see the person behind the camera or the persons. Now, the photographer sent these images to a bureau that creates this magazine for the customer, which is a railway company. You get this magazine if you go by the railway from the Arlanda, the airport, in Sweden to Stockholm. By the way, uh, actually, yeah. there's a very live conversation in the comments about exactly this, that why did you agree to this? Ah, okay. uh, so this is also something that, uh, that um, I know that you can't see the chat, so I will just let you know. <laughs> okay, great, great. Well, I can check out the chat, but mm -hmm. the, then, then it seems on point that I brought it up because, uh, I mean, it's belittling if you say that, that women shouldn't have any responsibility in agreeing to, to be photographed like this. But it's very unusual that people analyze uh, the creators of this image. I mean, what was the photographer thinking? What was the bureau that created this magazine thinking? What's wrong with society when women are expected to be not only professionals, but also sexy, uh, being styled and posing like it's a fashion shoot. She said that she regrets these images today, but then she was new to the media and she trusted the older, more creative uh, photographer. So, and I, I would say that you're uh, in a power position as a photographer, since you meet many people who are not used to watching images, choosing between hundreds of images, you know, in a complete other way as a photographer, what messages you convey with certain angles and uh, situations. And, and people often trust you as a photographer. I mean, expect that you have, that you will take some responsibility 
in not portraying this person in a bad light. Uh, maybe I'll we'll check out the chat and see what people say. But it's very common that that we, I mean, it's a bit like victim blaming, that we we put all responsibility on the woman because I don't see people talk about this in, in pictures of men. How could uh, uh, this this male actor agree to this uh, this sexist portrayals? So I think that's a it's a very very interesting part of the discussion and. Um, Oftentimes, I think we get stuck in discussing one photo shoot instead of seeing these patterns you can see. So I think that's also um, a way to go forward is to actually pile up these examples, which I'm going to do uh, during this lecture to see it, to otherwise people can see, okay, but she agreed to take these pictures. What's the problem? Maybe she wants to be seen that way. Uh, but then you're, you're not addressing that there are differences in how men and women are portrayed and how can this, these differences uphold uh, inequality. Um, <laughs> this is a picture that the, the bank image of, uh, oh, who would have guessed that I own my own bank? Or this photo shoot of this professional chef really feels like 1950s ad in some way like this ad for a ketchup bottle that's so easy to open that even women can open it. Um, but so I, I the, the thing I did in the beginning of my career was criticizing media, criticizing companies that had sexist ads. And uh, uh, then people started to listen and actually ask me to create different projects um, guides to equal communication, for example. And in the, in the beginning, it was a little bit for me as a dog chasing cars, and then you actually catch the car. Okay, they, they actually listen to me now. So uh, I started working with different municipalities, governmental institutions, uh, bureaus that wanted their own guides. And uh, this, this was, uh, this, um, as I mentioned uh, a couple of times, the city of Gävle a city where they, the communications office in this municipality, they got criticized for these images. Images that they used in brochures, in their homepage, in different ads. And uh, they also hung these pictures as posters in the city hall windows. And uh, they got criticized and they had heard about me. I had been in that city, given a lecture about gender stereotypes. So they called me and asked if I could help them. We have gotten this criticism. Uh, we're not exactly sure why. Can you help us? So the first thing I did looking at these pictures from this city was the easiest thing you can do when you analyze gender roles in the media, counting heads. And there are different studies made with reg regular intervals, for example, who makes the news. Uh, it's uh, it's well, the project is called Global Media, Media Monitoring Project. And you can find it at whomakesthenews.org. And every five years, over 200 countries now, they analyze media, internet, newspapers, television during one day, and then compile these statistics of what is the gender balance uh, when it comes to who gets to be an expert in media, who is the reporter, who is interviewed, and globally, um, the, the last study showed that it's 75% men and only 25% women who gets to be the main subject in media articles. So not, not really an equal balance. And when I give lectures to journalists, they often say that, well, men are overrepresented over over in business, politics, important topics that we should cover. So what can we do? Shouldn't we just mirror reality as it is? And I think that's very naive to think that you can just neutrally, objectively mirror reality as it is. You're always part of creating our sense of reality. Who you choose to portray can lead to other people being able to identify with this person and see themselves in that role. But I'm coming back to that argument later. But when you just count heads, Okay, you can apply this to analyzing governmental institutions' photos, municipalities' photos. And I saw that in these pictures from the city of Gävle, 
it was almost twice as many men as women in these pictures. And I mean, that's unrealistic that it would actually look like this in the city. Uh, but the next step that I think is almost more interesting is doing what I did before with the images of the chef. Just with a couple of words, describe what people are doing in photos. And I was uh, really taken aback by how clear the pattern was in these pictures. In almost all images of boys and men, they were active, doing stuff, playing sports, working. In almost all pictures of women, they are taking care of children and then in a quite passive way. Um, and that aligns with the findings of the, the Global Media Monitoring Report as well. They have shown that most often when a woman is the main person in a news article, she is uh, presented in the role of a homemaker or parent, no obvious occupation given. Uh, in 68% of the cases. And uh, also women are uh, more than twice, almost three times as often identified by family status as someone's wife or mother. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a pattern you can see then both in how people are presented in the media and in the actual images themselves, in the news media and in governmental photos like this from the city of Gävle. And for me, it's so interesting that people actually didn't react to these photos when they were here and there in brochures, in, in this municipality's homepage. It was when they put up these pictures as big, beautiful posters in the window of the city hall, where the biggest walking street in the city passes by. They have a big square where you can walk by these images every day. And then I think it became impossible for people not to notice these stereotypical patterns. Like here, for example, the tough boys jumping out into the ocean from a pier and a group of girls just standing there passively watching the boys. And then you put your municipality's logo on this picture. Move to Gävle. We love gender stereotypes. Uh, if you live here, it will be like the 1950s every day. Here you have a family playing mini golf. And uh, the dad is mansplaining how you putt. And the mother looking very impressed. She's almost uh, exploding. She's that impressed by daddy. Um, and one thing we did in the beginning of this project, when I actually helped uh, this city of Gävle fix this problem, was to make a gender renovation. I found the same family and took a picture when they went bowling instead. Took the picture when it was the mother's turn to throw the bowling ball and when the dad was cheerleader with the kids. And uh, well, that, I think that's uh, very effective to also put like a hashtag on this method um, to inspire people to either do this themselves. I mean, you can always find the same models, the same family and take a new picture or just think in that way. How would I like to renovate this picture? But one interesting thing, was, this was in the beginning of creating this project. And I realized, well, I could have actually renovated this family from other categories than just gender. It's the most typical family you see in media, in governmental photos, in advertising. Um, heterosexual couple, mom, dad, two kids, the nuclear family, they're white, appear to be middle class, no obvious disabilities. So then I started to think, okay, if we're gonna make a guide to criticizing norms in images, you can't only talk about gender. And we decided, we, wouldn't it be good to have some kind of checklist when looking at images like this to see if you have mirrored society as it is. And then we uh, realized that we have a very good checklist in the Discrimination Act. I think, I think most countries have some kind of Discrimination Act. I'm not sure, but in Sweden, we have seven discrimination grounds. Uh, so categories, you can report yourself discriminated by your workplace or school. And those are gender, transgender identity, ethnicity, religion or other belief, disability, sexual orientation, and age. So I think this makes a very robust 
beginning of a checklist. Then you can, of course, add other categories. Uh, class, for example, uh, body type, uh, things that absolutely affect who gets to be seen in the media and how. But we, we tried using this checklist on the same images from the city of Gävle, saw that it was only two people who seemed to be over 60. Uh, and that's about two and a half percent of these photos or these models in these photos. And reality, in reality in Sweden today, 25% of the population is over 60. So it's not uh, an accurate mirror image of society as it is. Only two people who seem to have a non-Nordic background in images, uh, in these images. And same thing there should be about 10 times as many if this were to be an actual depiction of how the population looks in Sweden. There's no people with visible disabilities no same-sex couples, one seagull at least. So some diversity when it comes to species or some biodiversity. But I mean, uh, they were actually almost more embarrassed by this when we discovered this pattern. Because I mean, these images, the purpose was to show the city as it is. Show that, I mean, uh, everyone's uh, counted on in this city, but it's impossible that a city with 100,000 100, citizens, that everyone who lives there is straight. I mean, so you, you can't argue that that argument that the journalists often have, oh, we're just mirroring reality. Well, then the, this mirror is broken. And when we searched for volunteer models for this project, we got an email from Shastin and Eileen, who wrote that, oh, we're, we're two ordinary culture ladies, so a Swedish expression, culture aunts, that happens to be married. Um, but although we're very ordinary, maybe you want to have us in, in this guidebook anyway. And uh, the, the art director who worked with me on this project, he wrote an email to me when he, when he saw this email from them. And he wrote to me, wow, an older lesbian couple, heart, heart, heart. And he sent that email to them by mistake. And then he sat there and <laughs> blushed, cold sweat running down his forehead. Because I could imagine that would feel a, bit, a little bit exoticizing. Would be fun if they answered like, wow, a heterosexual male, heart, heart, hugs, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> so, uh, and I would say that's, that's um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, that's the biggest mistake you should look, look out for if your goal is to be inclusive and mirror everyone in society, not to be exoticizing. And actually, we made that mistake ourselves, I think, a little bit, because when we released this guidebook, we also made a photo exhibition of these photos. And then they weren't in the context of describing how to challenge norms, being more exclusive, uh, inclusive. Uh, the risk, I, I would say, if only some groups are shown in beautiful photo, exhibition, uh, photo exhibitions once a year during the Pride Festival, for example, uh, then you're saying that these people are special. Um, I wouldn't, I think, take, a pic take pictures of heterosexual older couples, for example, show them in a big photo exhibition um, and call, the, call it the heterosexuals. I mean, um, you're, you don't challenge norms, really, if some people are always shown, even if it's in a possible, positive way, as something special. So I, I, but at the same time, visibility is so important. If it's between this kind of visibility and none at all, this is more important, of course. And uh, globally, there's a group in society that's being questioned in a way that's really disturbing, I would say, um, along the lines of an anti-gender movement. Transgender people are also scapegoats in many countries. Um, and, and therefore, I think it's very, very important to, first of all, make transgender people visible. The media should find ways to do that. Because also, if you look at statistics, um, in Sweden, the public health agency uh, found out uh, through a survey that close to 60% of transgender youth 
had seriously considered suicide, and 40% had made at least one suicide attempt. So, uh, but this is the, then um, a young transgender boy that I interviewed and took photos of for this guidebook, who could be open with his gender identity in his small uh, elementary school in a small city outside of the city of Jarle, who had great support from his mother, from his teachers, principals, classmates, but I think that's still maybe quite rare. Um, and one way of changing that is more visibility, more stories, more interviews. Uh, you can see that globally also, just to connect to this survey, Global Media Monitoring Report, that they found, they found the same pattern, that transgender people are um, in extreme minority in who gets to be the main person in a news, news article. I mean, disappearingly few transgender people being visible in the media. So visibility is very important, when, but when it comes to equal communication, this isn't really equal, showing some people in photo exhibitions. Uh, and I, I wondered what would be a more equal way of making people visible. And I came up with this catchphrase, including without making it obvious. Because when I looked at examples from companies that I suspected had good diversity in their, in their photos, in their communication, I noticed that pattern, that this is how they do it. IKEA, for example, they had an interview with a lesbian couple in uh, one of their catalogs. And never once in this article were there any questions about their sexual orientation. There were no headlines or captions or questions about that. They were just the family in this article, talking about furniture or interior decoration. And then you have included people from an often underrepresented group, but highlighted them as not as a special, but just the family, the normal citizen. And uh, I mean, all, both these ways are effective, I would say. Visibility talking about how some group could be discriminated, but this is more equal when you actually look at it. Uh, this is a Volvo ad, and unfortunately, I can't find the copywriting for this. But it was something. It's the the headline was uh, "Choose Volvo to protect the ones you love." I mean, highlighting the how how safe Volvo cars are. So instead of writing. We at Volvo believe in equal rights for all kinds of couples, something like that, which also would be good. I mean, standing up for, for LGBTQ people's rights. But here it's, they, they went beyond that and said that, oh, this is just a, a natural part of our customer group. And I think that is including without making it obvious, and that's the most equal way if you want to be inclusive in your communication. Another example from the city of Javle, after we created this photo project, they created a photo exhibition, another photo exhibition with um, 100 citizens from Javle. And here you can see, if you compare these photos to the, the summer photos I showed in the beginning, that this is a much more realistic image of how the citizens actually look in this city. People of all kinds of ethnicities, ages, uh, sexual orientations, interests, it's much more colorful depiction of this city. And then they use these images in a way that for me was like, ah, brilliant. They used the, these pe people as ambassadors who gave their own summer tips of what to do in the city in the summer. So for one, uh, one example was Esther Isaksson, a three-year-old with Down syndrome. And uh, instead of being an example of a kid with a disability, she was an example of a citizen who came with her own summer recommendations to other people. My favorite is the water park at Fudevik Zoo. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think it's so brilliant because she also gets a voice. She gets to be the main person here with her own unique interests, hobbies, or advice to other people what to do in the vacation. So, um, 
As I said, including without making it obvious, that for me was an eye-opener. Another eye-opening quote, I think, is, you can't be what you can't see. Uh, the founder of Children's Education Fund said this fund. And it has been proven in a lot of scientific studies that we need role models. We need to see people who look like ourselves in different occupations or in different sports or art forms to realize that, oh, I can do this as well. If you've never seen someone like you in a certain position in society, there's a risk that you won't even get the idea to try yourself. For example, seven-year-old Amanda asked her mother, can a girl become a professor? And her mother said, of course. But uh, little Amanda didn't believe her. She was like, no, because she had never seen a professor that was a woman in a children's program or in an advertisement. So for her, the professor is a man. But then her mother proved her wrong by writing down their conversation in a Facebook post. And uh, a couple of days later, it turned out that this post had been spread so virally that professors that are women all over Sweden decided to write postcards to Amanda. She got a lot of mail. I'm a professor, I, I do research about space, or I'm a professor and I teach in history. So she could up, put up a whole wall of uh, female professors that, that showed her then, changed her, uh, and proved her wrong. Women can be professors. Then she decided that, ah, I think I'm gonna become an entertainer instead. Ungrateful kid. <laughs> but we have these pictures every day in our, in our media, in ads, in the images that surround us every day. Uh, this is from the Swedish, biggest Swedish morning newspaper, um, Daily News. Swedish bosses are good at giving praise. So they had gotten a, a, survey, a poll that showed that Swedish bosses are good at giving praise. And they could have chosen any picture for this headline because a Swedish boss could have any gender, any age, and any ethnicity. But it was like they had a cliche checklist, like the boss is a man, older, white, married, uh, espresso drinker, suit wearer, check, check, check. And what these images do is that they cement the mental image that we already have of who can become a boss, who is supposed to be a boss, what is a boss, boss supposed to look like. And in, in uh, almost any occupation that has some kind of gender bias in it, you have these, the power uh, to, instead of putting more cement on this mental stereotype, this image we already have, you can challenge it and tickle our imagination and remind us that we can become anything we want to. So this is, for, for example, I photographed Fanny, a 13-year-old biker who competes in road racing. Photographed uh, a guy from Syria who rides a horse, at least in Sweden, that's most commonly a uh, feminine hobby, you could say. But when I interviewed him, he was like, what, really? In, in Syria, uh, most people who ride horses are men. It's seen as very masculine. I don't know, what is the case in Estonia? Riding a horse? Yeah, it is uh, portray portrayed very much. Uh, I actually remember one news about uh, some kind of a, a training, uh, training. It was an article about how there's some kind of a local place where like um, people can go and learn how to train uh, horses. And then the picture was like all girls who were holding a horse. And the title was especially funny that that uh, this school is pulling girls to horses uh, as fast as we are like investing in the new green stock or something. It was a ridiculous mix of, uh, of, uh, of this very gender idea. So, yeah. Mm. Well, um, so, so this in Sweden, in the Swedish context, this was a, a norm breaking image, but from, from his origin culture, that would have been just an ordinary image. So I think that's a, that's a, I think Sweden and Estonia is close enough that we would share the same stereotypes, but we'll see. I have some examples uh, that I will show you later. And most of all, when we do the workshop, I've saved the best examples for the workshop. So please join that if you haven't signed up for it already. Uh, but with images, you always have the chance to 
as I said, to challenge people, challenge the image of who is supposed to be a boss. Imagine a boss. Even if we hear a label like that, boss, or if it's a profession, we create this image in our head. And <laughs> in this photo exhibition, when you see first this image, and you round the corner, then you see the rest of this silhouette being filled up. But I mean, uh, you can do this just, just in simpler ways. If the assignment is to portray a carpenter or a preschool teacher, you can just think, okay, what is the expected image? And, there, and how can I challenge that? Uh, something I also focus a lot of is identifying and avoiding uh, or challenging gender cliches in images. But the first part uh, I think is necessary to know which gender stereotypes to challenge at all. And for that, I mean, I would recommend creating your own checklist. Uh, I've created several different checklists um, depending on, I mean, what, uh, what uh, the customer have, what kind of communication they have. And I've also, um, I mean, the reason that I'm so invested in challenging gender stereotypes is also because I've, I've made all these kind of gender fails myself as a young photographer. All the cliches you can imagine, I think I've stepped in. This, for example, I would say is gender cliche number one, portraying men slightly from below and women slightly from above. You can see that, that pattern in, in selfies as well, that boys are expected to want to take pictures from below and girls from above, uh, adults as well. And this, this perspective to the right has been used historically in political photography, for example, as a way to give someone more symbolical power. Because if you're portrayed from below, you appear bigger, uh, you look more important, more impressive, uh, and if you, you're photographed from above, you often look smaller, less powerful, less threatening. Um, and these, um, these patterns you can see in uh, the, the, what's interesting for me is that it's often women with a lot of power who have the most steep from above express, um, perspectives. Like this, for example, she was CEO of the biggest, two biggest news magazines in Sweden when this picture was taken and she's photographed almost straight from above. I mean, where is the photographer when this picture is taken? Is the photographer hanging from a ceiling fan? Melinda Gates, one of the most powerful women in the world, says the headline and the caption. And she's photographed also almost straight from above with a flowery carpet as background, no desk to work at. At least Gunilla had a desk, uh, empty desk. So I don't know if she's getting much work done there, but uh, she was um, running for prime minister of Sweden when this picture was taken, photographed almost straight from above, uh, hands tied to the back, it looks like. Looks very, very small, very non-threatening. And it's interesting because she uh, got criticized for having a too hard and cold image. Uh, people said that, oh, she's, she's like a robot. She can't be a, a prime minister. And that's so interesting because I've never heard people say that about a male politician, that, oh, he's too cold. Um, then it's usually seen as something positive to not be emotional, uh, be logical, be driven by uh, reason, not by emotions. But uh, what's interesting is that when she was challenged within the party, when they, they thought in this conservative party that, oh, she's not a viable candidate after all. Then images like this started to appear in the media when she, I think they wanted her to look more feminine, uh, giggling by herself in a warm red dress with a non-threatening coffee cup in her knee, uh, legs tightly together. Not, not, not a power pose, I would say, but not a very natural image at all. How often do you sit by yourself drinking coffee and giggling? Reminded me of uh, an image bank cliche. Uh, when, you, when you look at the genre photos, women are laughing alone eating salad. Like you do as a woman. 
at least in in the world of image waltz or taking shower and singing yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing ever the salad is my favorite <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i mean it's such a shame that that men can't enjoy life uh, enjoy singing in the shower or having a very funny moment with a salad in isolation um this is also i think uh this is she she got the, the award the most powerful woman in business in 2014 looks like she's sitting in jail i mean why was this thought of us as a power portrait peeking through the blinders looking a bit nervous i think um this is from uh, three years ago a woman for a i mean a ceo for a big foods company and then the the photographer thought it was a good idea to let her stand in a freeze stand on her knees in a freezer on a bed of frozen brussels sprouts i mean <laughs> well what has changed since i started uh 10 years ago giving lectures about this blogging about this it is that people are aware of these patterns now and they're very quick at uh, making fun of examples like this putting down a male ceo as well in the freezer for comparison. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but a feminist theory uh, founded by the film theorist Laura Mulvey in the 70s is very useful in when analyzing images, all kinds of imagery, imagery, regardless if it's movies or advertising or news media photos, the male gaze. And she originally talked about Hollywood movies, how when a woman comes into a room in a scene in a 1950s Hollywood movie, the camera follows her from the, from the feet up, like da -na -da -na, and puts every moviegoer in, this, in, the, in a male uh, gazing position, heterosexual male's gaze. And she applied that also, and it has been applied since then in seeing, okay, why are women objectified and inviting the viewer to desiring or viewing their body in different ways. This is a CEO of a big tech company. She was CEO of Yahoo when this picture was taken. Uh, and it was a lot of debate about that uh, during this time. Uh, very, very successful woman in a male dominated business. Why was she portrayed like this? But the, the article was in vogue. So that makes it a little bit more difficult also. It was in a fashion magazine and she was interested, I mean, she is interested in fashion, but still um, women in tech often have to fight to be taken seriously. And people asked what kind of responsibility does she have taking picture, pictures like this? So uh, we're back in that discussion. Whose responsibility is it, is it to challenge these uh, sexist, differences in who has to be an object, not only a professional. And uh, this was, was interesting looking at Estonia examples, uh, just scrolling through these different magazines. There was a lot of images like this in, in the business section, uh, even looked at, uh, uh, well, I have the list of the, the magazines I looked at. It, it's coming a little bit later, but I mean, it feels so needless, I think. Uh, to uh, first, I mean, I mean, Silvano Fashion Group, then I had to look at them and, okay, so they're, among other things, they have underwear as a product in this uh, in investment group, but, but still, uh, I, I would say decorating your news magazines with pictures like this, is that really necessary? And what function does it really fill? Um, in, in England, you have this uh, page nine girl, actually made me thought, think about that a little bit. Like having excuses of, for no obvious reason, objectifying women's bodies as a part of the, the news flow. And there was another, this magazine, Postimes, I don't know how you pronounce it. They also had this kind of uh, mixed in with other news. Uh, the, the one to the left, some kind of Australian influencer who took bikini photos to, uh, I don't know exactly what the purpose was. 
And like this, you could see that uh, it, you can call it clickbait, just uh, trying to make use of content from social media in some way. But at the same time, uh, finding excuses to, somehow to have uh, undressed women in your magazine. And to the right, I saw a gallery that seems to be photos taken by this magazine, 18 plus gallery. Uh, and when I clicked on it, I had to confirm that I'm above 18. And that even more, I think, felt like the kind of traditional pinup that British tabloids have, this kind of um, object, of, like, I mean, a treat for your readers, so to say, or to sell this magazine with objectification, object, <clears throat> sorry, objectification of women. Uh, and I never, I couldn't enter this gallery, by the way. It seems to be kind of some kind of uh, Halloween party um, because then I had to buy an ex subscription and didn't want to do that. No, but anyway. We don't want to give money to Postimes, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good that I saved that money. But that's interesting. There was a big debate uh, along the lines of pin up calendars isn't very common, I would say. That's a thing of the past. At least the big companies would produce that and give it to their customers. But it was a big debate a couple of days, a uh, couple of years ago, just a couple, one year ago, two years ago, a big Finnish forestry machine company uh, together with um, a supplier company from Germany, they created a kind of pinup calendar that they sent to their customers. And uh, there was a big debate about this actually uh, an organization for women who work in forestry was created um, during this time. And one of their, the, um, this criticism was a part of their foundation. And it was actually a good debate because uh, many of the biggest forestry companies in Sweden decided to not, uh, or rather they threatened to stop buying forestry machines from this company if they didn't stop publishing this calendar. Um, so many people were surprised that this still could be happening in uh, Scandinavia in, in the 90, I mean, 2020s, but it led to a good debate and uh, also led to this organization hiring me to create a new calendar. So that's a project I just finished when I took portraits of women who work in the forestry business all over Sweden like Anna Utter on this picture, for example, who is a forestry machine driver. So that's, uh, it's actually being released in, in a week, this calendar. So an example of how you could take something extremely backwards and look forward. And it was actually sponsored by the same company who produced this calendar. So they, they realized that uh, they wanted to be a part of the solution, actually part of a more equal future. So they, they sponsored this calendar. Okay, I think uh, we should take a little, bit, a little break. And during this break, I have two images here that you can look at. Uh, I can uh, reveal, because for, for Swedes, it would be obvious that the guy to the left, I mean, the guy to the right is uh, the prime minister of Sweden. Uh, he's stepping down, so only for a little bit more. And the woman to the left is a very influential political author and journalist. So I want you to just look at both these covers and think, what kind of stereotypes can you see? Not only in the pictures of her, but also in, in images of him and what kind of messages about gender you, can, you, can, you think you can interpret in that photo. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave this, these two photos for 10 minutes, you can also just stop looking at images, take a break from looking at the images, go get some coffee or tea. But in 10 minutes, 10, uh, 12 past two, we'll- It's uh, again. three, uh, 10 here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Great that you made that clear. Yes, okay. so in 10 minutes, we'll be back. Yes, excellent. All right.
Okay, 10 minutes have passed. So first of all, during the break, did you have any time to analyze these pictures? And does anyone want to lift up any differences, details, stereotypes you think you notice? Yes? Talisa wants to raise the hand. Go ahead, Talisa. Hi. So um, first of all, I noticed that there are two different magazines for two different uh, audiences. So the one on the left seems to be like some more gossip sort of a magazine that the, the picture of this woman is just right next to a sentence about some apple recipe. Uh, whereas in the right, then there is the guy that it's more like formal and some audience that maybe it's just about business or politics and uh, more uh, different. Um, at first, my, my thought about the clothes that the woman uh, was wearing were like, uh, she doesn't seem to be someone who you can take seriously because of the position, the clothing, and why not maybe put her on a suit. But then I also analyzed, well, why would a suit of that uh, a man usually wears uh, equal that uh, it needs to be taken seriously <laughs> and not the dressing of a woman? That it's more maybe about how the picture was taken. If she was in the same clothes, the same dress, but with a different pose, could make a very big difference than just on the on the floor. Um, something that I found interesting about this man it's that uh, usually politicians or or men that are portrayed as uh, leaders or um, businessmen are like they're always serious as if it was uh, as if smiling or showing emotions would equal weakness and uh, this man also like has this serious face as usually and uh, maybe even afraid of showing any sort of emotion <laughs> um, and then in, in women uh, usually women are portrayed as like happy or doing something different and, and giving you this um, I don't know safety uh, feeling about it, like uh, non-threatening as we were talking about before. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things that I noticed. Wow, excellent analysis. I think you not noted a lot of interesting patterns, but first of all, the magazine to the left is not a gossipy magazine. It's actually the workers' movement magazine in Sweden. So it's kind of a socialist magazine. That's, uh, but I mean, because of that image, you made a whole different interpretation of this magazine. And I think that says something pretty embarrassing for their sake. But uh, <clears throat> you, didn't, you compared now the clothing and the poses, and you had a very norm-critical thought uh, that, oh, would the respectable way, way to be for her to pose like him or have a suit on? Because then you're still saying that the masculine way of posing or being dressed, that that should be the norm that everyone should strive for. I think that was very clever of you. Because uh, if, if the, his purpose in these photos is to signal leadership, I mean, how good of a model is that for leadership? Uh, looking very uncomfortable, uh, I mean, looking uh, very joyless, kind of hier hierarchical, dominating way of signaling leadership. But maybe someone else has a point about this. I see another hand raised. Yes, I would. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing I noticed the first, because I'm using a small screen, was actually typography. So uh, the font that is used on the picture of the female is uh, ridiculously childish. So if you say that the, this is the workers' magazine, um, my first impression is that I, I can't take it seriously if they are using the font where the letters are turned upside down and um, I, I don't know what is the idea of behind it maybe it's the official uh, uh, style of this magazine but, uh, but that was my first impression yeah, additionally to what was mentioned before yeah uh, there's this one one of the different way that women are diminished in photography or in communication or role uh, uh, I've heard people call it infantilization, that she's portrayed like a little girl, both in the way she's posing 
And as you point out in the typography, it's handwritten letters. Uh, it's her name, Katrin Kielos, and one of the N's are reversed. So, I mean, is she five years old and have just learned how to write her own name, but not quite correctly yet? And I think this is unconscious from their side. I mean, I, I don't think they want to belittle her in this way. But in how they're treating her, I mean, she's lying on a pile of paper. Is, I mean, does she write her manuscripts, book manuscripts or debate articles by hand? Everything it just looks like it should be actually be a five-year-old girl in this photo. And that's called infantilization. So, so one way of diminishing a person. <coughs> Sorry. But I would also say that men are often also diminished in the way Stefan Levian is portrayed in the right image. In the way that the whole register of human emotions are cut out or uh, put in inside a small box. Um, the way you could express yourself is much more limited. And I don't know if anyone thought about that, but how would it look if he was portrayed like in the image to the left, lying on the floor, smiling, or in a red dress? I mean, it's, it's often unthinkable. Or it would, in 100% of the cases, be interpreted as a, some kind of joke. And why is it a joke? Would it be a joke for men to pose like women are portrayed? While it would see, I think it would be seen as a, a power pose if she would put, be portrayed as him. Maybe some people would be like, oh, she looks uh, like a cold robot or a bitch, or I mean, uh, because women are expected to radiate warmth and, and be pleasant. Um, but many people would still think it obviously as a power pose, I think. But uh, uh, so I would say that uh, the male general is often more narrow and limiting, which you also can see in images. Uh, for sure, men are often portrayed with these classical power uh, portrait methods. Here you have a man with not only a from below perspective, but also a very wide man spread, taking up much space. Um, but also I would say that the most typical male gender cliche is the murder gaze, I call it, looking like you want to strangle the photographer. And uh, for me, it's so sad to see that this is some kind of ideal, because while men are uh, overrepresented in the top in society, in business, in politics, so forth, men are also overrepresented in the bottom of society. Most homeless people are men, most uh, people caught up in some kind of addiction are men. Most people who commit suicide are men. And I think that's attached to this ideal you can see that as a man, you're always to be, supposed to be on top. You should never show weakness or vulnerability because then you're not a real man. I think that's what's being communicated in these successful alpha male millionaire murderers. You can see in the covers. But also, Emotional I, oppression. Yeah. Here you have uh, two parenting magazines, and I, I think that you can clearly see that one gender role is quite lost. Uh, mm. Despite the fact that you have a row of murderers on the daddies magazines. Do you notice anything missing? Mm -hmm. in... children. <laughs> exactly. Where the fuck are the kids, daddy? <laughs> and here, if you look at typography, colors, everything, I mean, they're so stereotypical, both these covers. But the main, the message that you should have as a parenting magazine, it should be about parenting, right? <laughs> and I think that message doesn't really come forth if you don't have any kids on the cover. But uh, I wrote about this uh, magazine on my blog. I used it as examples in lectures. And then they wrote to me, the CEO of the publishing group that creates this magazine. Hey, I saw the picture from your lecture. Thanks for pointing it out. Um, you're of course right. The covers from now on will have dad with kids. That's what the magazine is all about, smiley. Uh, so I was very glad when I, when I read this message. Uh, first, I thought they wanted to sue me. Uh, then I realized, OK, they actually want to change. Um, and then they sent this image. 
And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> it's a kid there, but here the kid looks like a murderer <laughs> or like a ghost kid. Uh, like the dad is like, oh, it's not real. <laughs> no connection in image, mm. um, but one step in the right direction. But I think this point is very, very important to make because uh, men should also be interested in changing these narrow gender roles that in some, some ways, I mean, harm both men and women and people who don't identify that way. But uh, the gender role in itself is, I mean, ridiculously narrow. And uh, the expect expectations of who is supposed to be a nurturing parent, you can see that in uh, Estonian media as well. I saw this headline and image and I was curious because since I don't uh, speak Estonian, I see the images first and I was like, okay, here's a mother, there's no father in the picture, what could be the message? And then she's here in some kind of ex expert role saying that kids can have more than, is it two or two and a half years two and a half. bigger gap mm -hmm. uh, in ages? So kind of an expert uh, airing this opinion, but why couldn't it be a dad? in a magazine giving this kind of opinion. I mean, it uh, would be so much more norm breaking, I think, to just take it for granted that men can be the caretaker that has something to say about uh, child rearing or bringing up kids. Um, so that's something I would like to see. Well, I have looked through other examples. Um, Hand picked some examples from these different magazines listed below, uh, which Nelle was uh, very gracious in pointing out, <laughs> nominating for gender analysis. And uh, um, well, I could find um, the typical shy portrait of a very, very powerful woman. She's the justice minister and uh, put, portrayed peeking forward around the corner of something, um, half hidden. Am I right that she's the Minister yes. of Justice? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, not very typical to see men like this, half covered, peeking forth. Uh, Peekaboo image, I would call it. <laughs> Peekaboo. Uh, woman portrayed in the business magazine, I looked at. Mm -hmm. Portrayed from above sitting on a couple of logs. But I mean, she's, when you look at how she's dressed, looks like she's on her way from a job meeting, stopped by, maybe she's working in a forestry industry, I'm not sure, couldn't re really take the time to read all the articles thoroughly. But you have the clear from above perspective. Would be more impressive, I would think, if she would be portrayed either from eye height or where you could see more of the environment, that she could take up more space. Um, this, I'm just, I'm just curious if you could maybe tell me what the headline is about. Uh, this is a, a musician, an artist. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I haven't read this, but she has, I think, a vibe going on that is very like a, a mix of this national, close to nature thing going on, uh, but I don't know the, the content. Okay, well then then, then it's, uh, I mean, I noticed this in a business magazine, yes. so, so I was confused. Uh, maybe she's selling fur coats, I was thinking. <laughs> but if she's a musician, then of course you have a wider span of expressions you could use. Um, and she's looking like some kind of uh, either wild animal or uh, far forest creature, fairy mm -hmm. walking mm -hmm. around in the woods. Okay, thanks for explaining that. Here you have an article just about moving to the countryside and what kind of allowances you could apply for. <laughs> the man looks, I mean, it's a good portrait of this guy. He looks very happy, not a murder case, but then he's upstaged by the woman uh, on top of him in this ladder enjoying being in the countryside in the open air. So here you can see, I mean, men can enjoy themselves this much, can smile. 
but women they they really embrace open air this much and smile but women they they really embrace open air now this i hear myself smile. can you hear me i heard a recording of it uh, strange uh here was the only image of a, a person with a visible disability I saw in, in all these magazines. And then I noticed she was from Israel, one, one minister that is using a wheelchair. Uh, oh, you can see the, the uh, Israeli flag also as well. But so that's something. Uh, didn't see any people with visible disabilities in these days. I follow this media. Uh, Images of the men, <laughs> especially in the business magazine, of course, I saw many important men having serious meetings uh, too, too concentrated to be interrupted by the photographer. Making these kind of gestures in the middle of meetings or important decisions. And interestingly enough, <laughs> A lot of men pointing at or overviewing cities, like this guy, pointing out something in the cityscape from an office. Mm. Or this guy just uh, watching over the, the city um, in his uh, shirt and tie. I have to say it's a bit weird picture, that one with the ha uh, leg on the radiator. Yeah. It just feels a bit odd one out, but it looks like it's almost like accidentally, not on purpose, that uh, kind of like with this very official suit and then being in this corner and just like uh, leaning on the radiator. It feels a bit random. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, actually, I thought it, this could be an image bank photo uh, because mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm not sure it's an actual portrait. It is. It is, yeah. Yes, it's somebody that made a picture of that person. Yeah. But maybe that's good then, that it's an unusual picture mm -hmm. that makes it stick out against the other ones, otherwise predictable images. Mm -hmm. uh, here you have guys working with uh, crypto. <laughs> looking crypto like uh, allows men to do the hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Real winners uh, cashing in big in crypto. Looks like the Wolf of Wall Street office, I think. Uh, only young guys in this office. Mm. Here we have a very sad man <laughs> who has uh, lost a fortune, it looks like. Mm. This, I mean, that this is very, very, very uncommon to see women portrayed just standing right up and down, just standing here straight. They couldn't look more straight <laughs> than this in this photo, just standing there. Uh, so it was a funny image for me. Some quite good examples I found. This I thought looked pretty empowering. Also with all the stats and with the very firm gaze, crossed arms. She looks like she's an expert. She knows what she's talking about. Someone worthy to listen to. A uh, very soft looking man. Uh, really cute gaze being very close to the camera as well so i thought this was very nor breaking uh me millionaires still a millionaire but uh like but, just uh from a wage worker uh, to a millionaire just by the force of power so it's like uh mm. or like willpower i'm sorry so it's a very neoliberal uh title with this very soft gaze that's interesting yeah 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 usually it's the other way around even when you have like a soft headline or soft angle in an article, then you still have the very macho picture. Here is the, the other way around. Very interesting. These you can see in the same magazine, different photographers, but the exact same pose. She looks a little bit more soft, a little bit more relaxed. I can, I can think he looks a little bit worried, maybe, but the same pose. And if you treat everyone equally, when you take a picture, I mean, that's, that's one easy way to, to just be equal in your photography. Say, same pose for everyone, but that could become a little bit boring if everyone was played like this, I think. 
they almost have the same pose as well. But I think the guy looks a little bit like a murderer. Medical students calling people, trying to convince them to take the vaccine, vaccine or at least being aware of the benefits of that. Uh, here have another man, man with a phone. The last example I'm going to show you before uh, we take a break for those who are going to participate in the workshop. This is the communications director from the city of Jävle who greenlit this uh, project, Images That Changed the World, and who got this criticism for the summer images and actually decided to listen. And it was such a pleasure to work with him because uh, he, when I met him, felt like the stereotypical middle-aged, um, white, successful man who wouldn't maybe be interested in challenging generals. But he has proven me wrong many times. When we made the international version of this guidebook and for this vision, I, uh, we had to remove some bad examples we had of stereotypical images. And then I asked him, uh, could I use you to illustrate different feminine stereotypes in photos? And he was like, of course, I'll do anything. What do you want me to do? <laughs> so we took this, this image, a cute from above perspective, but I think this is just a good image of him. Looks like a boss you would like, I mean, would dare to talk to, uh, would listen, actually. This I also th think looks like an available boss that listens. Come to us, let's talk about your salary. And of course, we had to try to take more objectifying poses to move to a blood red sofa instead. And he was analyzing himself when we tried different poses. So he said, ah, if I had my, if I would have the hand on my shin, that would be an acceptable pose for a male leader. But playing with your lips, that's not, not something you're supposed to do. It's a male leader. Uh, and this pose, I think we're mo both most proud of. Took some stretching for him to be able to do this pose. Inspired by many examples we could find of successful women in different professions and industries. Uh, so therefore we call the image posing like a boss. And if you want to see more examples like this, uh, as I said, you can find this guidebook either through visiting my blog, genderphotographer.com, or searching for sharing Sweden and images that change the world. There you can find a toolkit of both the exhibition photos and this guidebook. And if you want to practice Swedish, there's all the Swedish version on my blog that you can download. Thank you so much for participating, asking good questions and analyzing these images. Uh, I think it seems like you have already a very sharp look for these, th these things. But as I've said, uh, please join me in the workshop in 15 minutes.